Cool. All right. So like I said, this is sort of part two of the workshop specific concerns of water care comparison, but we'll do the water care one after um, the zoom in. So we wanted to go back to this. Uh, Don sort of touched on this a little bit before uh, about separating the entities as a functional being versus the governance of them. So I thought I'd start there. That sort of came through a lot of the comments. There were things in this sort of space about, you know, what does a service provider do? You know, questions about the entities as being decision makers or decision followers um, and who are the real decision makers in this space. And then as part of that, a subset of that is, you know, what's the role of EU in the overall makeup? So I thought I'd start here. So I've added a box, uh, two boxes to this that uh, you may not pick up from last time, which is central government and the governmental policy statements. We talked about it, but it didn't actually exist on this diagram before. So that's on the right hand corner there. And you see it's connectivity. Central government develops a policy statement and that gets funneled in with the strategic performance expectations into uh, the entity's response as a statement of intent. So that's just some functional stuff there. Uh, can you get rid of the next slide thing? So that's bigger. Oh man, you guys can see that. That's a shame. Uh, I'm struggling to read that. Okay, cool. As then, let me think of this. I need to go right click. Give me a second, guys. Hydra's interview. Okay, I'm going naked now, guys. My <laughs> notes are gone. I hope not. Okay, here I am. <laughs> Neil Goodyear already is. <laughs> okay, <laughs> sorry. That was my fault. We should keep it professional. Okay, so here we go. <laughs> So from, this is my interpretation from what all I've read and how it all works and the diagrams and things. So there is we still... Can only see you, we can only see you. Can you see us? I, I can, can only... See I can see too. just my slides. No. We can't see that. Okay, let's try this again then. Screen share. You're stop. very black and white. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we are now resharing that one. Try that. Is that... No. Yes. Hang on. Oh, yes. 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 Well done. Cool. So this here is my interpretation from everything I've read of how the entities get their direction. So the entities themselves, the government has said, are not direction setters, they are direction takers. So in this picture, the direction setters are those colored inside um, opaque, uh, no, opaque um, transparent red boxes. So you've got the central government, you've got your regional representative group, you've got um, your regulators to the left-hand side there. I've got a yellow group here around Mana Fenua because they are direction setters, but in a slightly different way to the rest. So we'll explain that as we go through the next slide. So like I said, here are our direction setters and what are they doing? What direction are they setting? So at least in my, in my interpretation, you've got the, um, the images down here represent the different groups. So you've got the top here, the regional representative group. So it's half LGNZ, half Mana Fenua, as you can see. It appoints a selection panel and it also sets a local strategic and performance expectation. That's fed into the entity. It says, go do these things. Uh, then you have an economic regulator, which I've represented by Commerce Commission here, our other type of regulator, and it will set the price path. Um, I am, I'm making a bit of a leap there because the regulator and how it's actually going to work hasn't been detailed yet. But in other jurisdictions like um, Scottish Water with Wix or Offwatt in the UK, uh, your economic regulator has a big part to pay in setting tariffs and telling you what the price of your product, in this case, water and wastewater service, is going to be. So I've made a bit of a leap there. Uh, they will also uh, set the direction for the entities by benchmarking service performance. So we see that with our Commerce Commission type stuff. Are you doing a good job, a bad job of what your core jobs are? Uh, then you have your drinking water regulator. And obviously they set the drinking water standards, which tells the entity what they need to achieve. Um, they'll determine compliance with that. So they'll measure whether you're doing it or not, as we know. And they will have a role in national, nationally benchmarking environmental performance. So this is slightly, this is more looking at the regional councils admittedly, but they receive that information by from the regional councils based on our performance or the entity's performance against environmental standards. You have your environmental regulator, um, for us, Environment Waikato, or um, Waikato Regional Council as they are now, and they set the environmental standards and obviously determine compliance with those standards. And then you have the, the bottom two here, which is the government, and they're going to set some sort of um, national strategic expectations. And then you have uh, Mana Whenua at the bottom there, and they set some 
cultural expectations and some local environmental expectations um, into the entities. So this is my take on all the parts that direct this entity. Uh, the entity itself is going to follow all this direction. It's not going to make any of that direction itself. So uh, just to really make those connections, this slide here is about the tools that each of those um, direct direction setting groups will actually use. So the regional uh, representative group will use the strategic performance and expect, uh, the strategic, strategic and performance expectation statement. Uh, they will also use through um, the, uh, the local government, the TLAs, the territorial authorities, spatial plans to say, this is how we want you guys to grow and perform. The Commerce Commission, and again, like I said, I've taken a bit of a leap here, so this might not actually eventuate. We'll set tariffs, we'll issue um, consumer reports, and reviews will be provided by independent experts. So we've seen a lot of that from the Commerce Commission and other um, areas in New Zealand. So I sort of expect them to work in a way like that uh, in order to set that direction through those tools. Uh, Tomato Otherwise is an easy one. They'll set some drinking water standards. Our regional Council will develop some regional plans and they'll develop regional council consents to tell you what you can and can't do as an entity. And then obviously uh, the government will set that national policy statement that we've seen. Um, uh, the, sorry, the, the GPS, the, the governmental policy statement, but also will indirectly set some direction through national policy statements and tools like that, which get picked up in regional plans and um, spatial plans and get delivered that way. And Mana Whenua, their, their specific tool that they will be using is the Tamana OTY statements. And that's what we see in our diagram out on the right hand side there in those green boxes. So local government has no no direction setting a building. Lo in my in my interpretation of what I've read, local government's ability to set direction will be at the uh, jointly preparing strategic performance expectations through the um, the regional representation group and directly through the development of spatial plans. I know there's an RMA review going on and that might mean that these spatial plans or whatever they actually get termed in the future might be done at a higher level than district council, might be regionally or whatever. But at the moment under what we have today, it would be our district plan would set that direction. So is that, does that make sense guys? Yeah, it looks like an expensive model. <laughs> I'd like it. But yeah. We, yeah, do um, a, we do have a, we do still have some input. Into the, where? Um, <laughs> district, well, the district plan at the moment identifies the direction okay. that in, infrastructure uh, needs to expand and cater for growth. Um, so that, I mean, that's that's the mechanism to identify where infrastructure needs to uh, respond. They they don't in themselves necessarily um, set that direction themselves. We don't. We do, but we work in two silos. One is our planning silo, and then one is our infrastructure silo. What this is describing is there will still be some direction setting uh, through our district plans but the infrastructure is dealt with by a separate entity. Yeah. And that's not arguing whether it's good or bad, I'm just saying. But I think we need, th there's some realities that have to be acknowledged. The RMA reforms are driving a greater regional approach. The Randerson report, if you ever want to uh, uh, lose a few hours of your life, go and read the Randerson report, which, which the government has effectively responded to and is developing. It's talking about planning and land use planning being driven uh, at a, um, a more regionalised level. Now, this, is, this is one of the things that, 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 that I don't understand. We're now at least one or two steps away from being able to do anything. We now have to convince somebody else or another organisation to bat, to go to bat on our behalf, and this is why some of the why people who are talking to me are concerned is we no longer are in are responsible for our own future. 
Well, you have to convince you're, someone you're, else first. You're right, Kevin, but to some extent, um, and I'm not I'm not trying to be um, clever or smarty pants by saying this, but to 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 a great extent, we're subject to regulatory constraint now. Mm. You can't just make a decision to um, rezone some land or take water from a river of our own free will. We're required to go through processes, and at the end of that, those processes, we can be successful or unsuccessful. So we don't have absolute power now or influence now because because of the regulatory frame we already work in. No, I agree. I agree with you. But at least we have it, as Neil would say, we have a we have a seat and we're inside the tent, not sitting on the outside. We're inside the tent, make it make it a, trying to make a difference. This we're not even in the tent here. We're, well, is it is it because there's another layer of bureaucracy? Is probably the is the point, isn't it, Kevin? Is that there's another step in the chain because the RMA is still the RMA, and we all have to give effect to to policy statements and stuff, and that's not going to change with the change in the RMA. But it's it's no. just that there's there's another layer, and that's where the bureaucracy comes into play. But yeah, if we get someone coming in wants to do a big subdivision, and we we have a hearing, well, what's the point in us hearing it? When, when what really now Waikato like Regional should be hearing because they're going to be the ones making the decision. All we could do would be to, to move that, what our decision was to regional and let them, let them go the, take the next step. Well, uh, that, that's really getting to the core of the RMA changes and what effect they're going to have. That's why we need to get that sorted not, first. James, not, going, not, not, back, not this. Back to hands, guys. So uh, James Sainsbury and then Neil Goodger. Yeah, basically, just I was just going to say, Kevin, hold that point. I think we should hold that thought that that would be something that we could unpack in our response to the government, um, but also just for ourselves that, you know, we're proposing other various models of amalgamation. Is that going to be any different? So, you know, let's make sure we, we capture the criteria or the critiques that we have for the for plan B and make sure that we apply it equally to all of these other things that have been thrown up as well. Yep, Neil, Neil Goodger. Yep, so it's, it's coming up this afternoon when we talk about water care, but I thought I'd brought up, bring it up now as well. It's about, you know, Kevin's asking about we can control ourselves. So I had, the, I had that extra hour to read the water care report and stuff, and this is my favourite comment from theirs on what they can do, what water care can do now that they own the district and everything else. Okay, so we are also reducing water pr pressure to, re to reduce water use. Reducing environmental flow releases from Waitakere, Kossies, and Wairua dams. So in other words, they can cut their own water flowing out of their dams because they're short of water. Yet we have to go to Waikato Regional Council to get a get a permission to do exactly the same thing. So if we're in the dam, if we're in the dam with Waikato Regional Council, then maybe we don't have to go cap in hand all the time. This is the thing when the big guys can get away with what we can't do. We have to do. We have to increase our environmental flow, whereas water care just say we just reduce the environmental flow. Simple and easy as that. The other key issue, one of the other key issues that we sort of saw in the comments was actually influence here. So you know what influence can NPDC have um, on the decisions of the um, of the entity under the proposed model? So obviously we've got. Uh, participation in the selection of half the rep regional re representation group and they develop the strategic and performance expectations. We probably have uh, little little input into regulators' expectations and um, we probably have little input but hopefully have some understanding because we've got strong um, mana whenua relationships into what may come out at least in our territory, our district, would come out into mana OTY statements. Uh, there's going to be a consumer body there, so we may have some influence, not as council, but as a community through a consumer body. And then obviously there's a need to publicly consult the entity. We have a need to publicly consult on key documents, which will give our community and ourselves and organisation the ability to feed back directly, you know, the prioritisation methodology, asset management plans and funding and pricing plans. Um, government policy statement. Uh, there's very little detail around exactly how that will function and whether that will be the type of thing 
that will go out for some form of consultation before it's provided to the entities. So I don't really know. But obviously moving forward in a RMA sense, we will have some influence over the spatial plans um, and how they are developed. So there are some touch points there for influence for us. Um, whether they are not, whether they're enough or not is, is where the debate is at. Uh, what other models could you have is also where the debate is at. And I do have some notes here. Um, the government set it up in this way. Their, their words, they set it up in this way because um, the Standard & Poor's rating um, said that to do it this way and have your asset owners who are council this far away and this involved have this much influence over the entity is best to generate a higher uh, rating score. But there were other scenarios that were tested and uh, those are all available in the Standard & Poor's work on the website there. I'm not a ratings expert. I don't understand exactly what the nuances are between the different ratings, but scenario three was a model that they tested uh, for a high degree of governor influence is what I described it. Uh, and that meant that the governors would have a approval of rights over the water service entity's statement of intent. So statement of intent would generate it, would go back up to the governors to approve that uh, before it was um, published and accepted. Uh, vote on the appointment of the oh, uh, But there was also, but that model also had no um, governor vote for who's going to be on the on the water service entity board. So anyway, there are other models out there that are looked at uh, is probably the point I'm trying to make out there. And like I said, the key discussions seem to be that we need to have in my mind uh, is the influence mix right for MPDC? Um, so yeah, if you guys want to talk about that, we can. Otherwise, there's the other side, which is accountability is the next slide. I think we're too far away. Yeah, so this was a key concern on a Zoom I was in uh, last evening, and Phil Goff expressed, expressed it very clearly from Auckland City's perspective. And, and I hope I'm not quoting him wrong here, but this is what I understood his view was. Uh, so he is very clear that he doesn't object to the direction of the reform or the intent of the reform. What he's concerned about is, from Auckland City's perspective, not having the ability to directly appoint or discharge directors. That was his concern. Um, and um, I think that's a, that's a um, um, issue that if you feel that you're not uh, able to have confidence in a board, how do you deal with that? How do you, who's going to hold them to account? How do we uh, hold them to account? What are some mechanisms we can use at the moment? If we're not satisfied the with the company's performance, uh, who will we be able to go to and express our displeasure? Yep. And will they listen? Well, yeah, that's the point. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Because I said, we'll, we'll find that out at one o'clock today when we can ask these guys whether they've sent a letter off already. Yeah, yeah. And, and I was just going to say, thank you, Neil. I meant to say it before. Look, these guys, I've warned them they're to uh, be prepared for any question or yeah. um, requirement, and uh, they, they've not shied from that. So, so if you, write down your questions now when you're, if you're having a bite to eat and you're yeah. done. Okay, uh, issues, accountability, Carl. Yeah, well, since, yeah, since the word accountability popped up, the next issue was, and they're related with influence here, is accountability. If, if the influence you have is not having the effect that you want, how the heck are you going to hold someone accountable? So I modified the um, image again to the side there to give you my interpretation of, of the levels of accountability in the model as it's been presented. Okay, and the, I guess the key question in my mind, hopefully it is yours too, is, um, you know, what's the right level of accountability in the right places? So um, the accountability is different. It's obviously different to what the accountability we experience in the water space with council right now. 
So the difference, obviously, as you guys know, is that every three years, if you do a bad job in water, you can be voted off. So there is a direct accountability for you guys as our council uh, to the rate payer, to the customer at the end of the day in relation to the service. But in this model, uh, you won't have that direct accountability uh, anymore. And that's why I'm showing that graduated color there. The most direct accountability for the entities board is going to be the selection panel. Uh, and then next it will be to the representative group because the representative group appoints the panel and then um, the owners of the assets and mana whenua are down the back there further away. Uh, mana whenua again are in a, a yellow box. That's more to indicate that I don't know, I have not seen or understood yet the mechanisms of accountability that the entity will have to the Tamana Otiwai statement. So the mana whenua will generate the statements as you see there in the diagram. There will be some sort of response from the entity. I don't know, and that's why they're in a yellow box, what the accountability is if the statement response is deemed to be unsatisfactory. I don't know. And then on the left-hand side there, your direct accountables, unlike our existing arrangement where you're the direct accountables, uh, the entity will be directly accountable to the regulators primarily. So you've got your regular economic, your... Um, environmental and your drinking water regulator. They will also be accountable to some extent to the consumer body. And I guess that's a question to pop out there is, is that the right mix? Is a indirect accountability to the territorial authorities and mana whenua, but a direct accountability to the consumer body, the right mix of accountabilities for this structure and way forward. Um, probably layering on top of that is uh, as the asset owners, as TLAs, as the asset owners, uh, is this the right level, right level of control versus proportionate liability that you may have going forward? Um, there are still te we're still teasing that out by through our discussion with the government and what the government's releasing about what sort of liability exists for the owners of the assets, even though they're not recognised on the books. Uh, Sue and then Neil. This, this might be a bit of a blonde thing, Carl, but just got to get it in my head. On any normal board, there is controls of, of tenure, et cetera, et cetera. And then there is the ability of the shareholder to vote in or out or make some decisions. So what you're saying is we have absolutely no, no input into the board? Mm-hmm. Absolutely none. You have an indirect input to the board through the selection of the regional representative group, which in theory should act on your behalf to, uh, to appoint an independent selection panel. So we have no voting rights on anybody on that board directly? No, uh, though, like I said, the previous slide, in my comments of the previous slide, um, I actually missed this, so sorry, I'll recap that. The previous slide, which was our um, influence one, there was a different scenario modelled for standard and pause where the governors, which would be yourselves as TLAs, uh, would have the ability to vote off to remove water service entities, chairs or members, but no ability to vote them directly on. Uh, that seemed to have an impact on the... Uh, on the... What's the word I'm looking for? On the credit score for some reason. I, that, I that's an error... That's an area that we could um, suggest because we are still theoretically the owner of that asset and therefore, you know, we should therefore have some input into voting into who is on that board. That would be something that I would be pushing for, that th there needs to be a bit of a change in there. Yeah, that's definitely something you guys can ask for. Neil. Yeah, so that's that's where that's where I disagree with you, Sue. Is that we we don't theoretic we may theoretically, but we don't own the assets because they are not going to be on our books. So, so we don't no, have any. No, control. but they say we own the assets. You know, yeah, you can't pick them up and that, take them away. Yeah. Pushing that that far, theoretically, we own the assets. Yeah. All that and, and the only thing I was going to say for, for Carl and the comment is, of course, we can't check all those other governance models and everything, Carl, because that's they're all redacted anyway. A lot mm. of that information is still crossed out, so we actually can't see it. So we can't see that the other governance models and other structures 
are just as sufficient or just have the same ability to borrow money. I'll, um, I'll pop you the, the link that I use. There is one report there which is less heavily redacted, and I went to that one to get a sense of the different structures and the impacts they had on, uh, admittedly, exclusively the um, credit score. Yep, so I, I've seen that one too with the credit scores, but it, it does still have stuff redacted and comments redacted in there. You know, So how can you get a, an open, uh, transparent conversation when there's a pile of redactions still in there. Yeah, I've got to, I've got to agree with uh, uh, Neil. I think the standards and pool thing is a little bit of a uh, well. I can't Smoke quite and mirrors. Yeah. Uh, well, I can't quite understand why, why the standards and pool would hate democracy so much. But um, I, I think the point, the the fundamental issue is the government's view that they, for the entities to be able to borrow more money, they need to be off the local authorities' books. Now, it's valid to say, aren't there other vehicles they could use to borrow money, um, per se, but uh, that was their one of their fundamental principles, we need them off the balance sheet so they're not constrained by the borrowing limits that the local authorities would ultimately hold them to. And that's and that's where Sue's elephant in the room comes back in it because the other people see that as con a conspiracy theory that they get it off the books because then they can share it with somebody else. Yeah, that, that you're right, you're and right. That, that's, and that's, that's the crux of the yeah. matter, is that yeah, if it still right. belongs to you and me, yeah. then we... It's up, heaven help, if we want to give it away half to another entity or another right. iwi. That's right. So, so my that's the understanding, of the matter, Don. Yeah. 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 My understanding of it is that the ownership definition will not include iwi, it will be local government. Yeah. Okay. And the other point to, to, to note at this point in time, yeah, at this point in time, but I, th I think it's, you know, again, it's a valid point to make that these are the local government's assets and they should be recognised as local government assets into whatever entity that they go into. And the privatisation of those assets is prevented by various mechanisms which the government is proposing. Now, I'm not again, I'm not saying if they're high enough or tough enough or should be added to and all the rest of it, but, but that's the theory. But the other point, and I just see Kevin raised a, a comment on chat there, is that just remember, it's the asset ownership is not about borrowing because they they can't borrow again against assets they can't sell. Like that because all they can borrow against is the revenue they can generate through their ability to charge, which is the same for us. We can't borrow on our asset value. We can only borrow on the revenue. So it would be fair to say that the board setup structure is of concern to us. I took it that the, the, the concern was that there was an inability to directly have yes. a... But this, uh, is, um, this is a major issue for us, is the, the structure and our ability to have some input. Is, is well, there's two issues there. Sorry, Sue, there's two issues, yeah. perhaps. One is, who are the directors? Yes. And the other one is the structure. Yeah. I mean, I had a rummage through Watercare's board and, you know, there's some pretty amazing people that, that um, will come on to these sort of things. But anyway, we have no control. No direct control over oh. who the directors will be, correct? Yeah. 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 And that's a valid concern. And we should. Well, I think we should get a vote. Absolutely. And how effective is that vote going to be out of 22 councils in the entity B in our case? Yeah, but it's only fair. I'm hungry. Adrian. Yeah, I guess this is where, you know, when we start talking about a vote, this is all about transparency at the end of the day too. You know, like it's, it's, 
again, that influence thing and transparency around the process and our degree of, of whether we don't understand yet what that what that looks like by the appointment of these boards or that we're just sceptical that that's not the yeah that we it's 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 not because we're not going to have a vote so yeah there's there's that element of again it's accountability and influence so we just come back to that over and over again any further so we want to vote really don't we that's one issue that we have we want to vote Yeah, and then I suppose, does that mean that Hamilton gets more votes than Little Mata Mata Piako? Because this is the whole thing around, around the level of um, investment required in different areas, and how do you, how do you bring all that together? Um, because there's always that conversation had with Fonterra with large suppliers versus small suppliers, and large suppliers get more votes than the small suppliers and you know when you're voting board for boards they the people touting directorships go to the bigger farm entities because they have more influence again see this is the interesting dilemma we're in yeah but that's yeah up to them but i think we should get a vote anyway any other questions see or, um, yep. kevin's made one on um, the chat uh, mr mayor uh, and I, I think uh, Kevin, just to respond to that, my my assumption, and I don't know, but my assumption is that why we can currently charge stormwater via a targeted rate at the moment, or through the general rate. So it's property serviced by stormwater, or a stormwater system, would presumably incur a direct property charge. So with lunch upon us, I might just get through these last three slides. Uh, we've broadly talked about these topics already. You won't be surprised. <clears throat> so ownership and privatisation. So this here was just about regurgitating to you guys exactly what the government's put out around this, which is as it's currently being pitched, um, it will require a 75% vote uh, for privatisation of the regional representative group. So you need a super majority there in order to privatise the assets. I guess the question for uh, for you is, is that enough protection? Uh, another opportunity we have in this space is that it was noted in the, cap in the recent cabinet paper that further policy work is required around exactly the mechanism of how this works. So possibly that's an opportunity for us to feed back to government at this juncture and say, hey, uh, this is what we think, or uh, we want to be this involved in the crafting of those things, or this uninvolved that's the other end of the spectrum as well you may want to not be interested at all uh, the next one is obviously um, ownership so ownership here this is again what was published in the cabinet papers around ownership um, local authorities will be the owners that will be protected in legislation it's a non-financial recognition of ownership or shareholding the rights of ownership are portrayed through the oversight and governance arrangement. And again, mixing that in with the accountability and influence um, issue, is it the right mix as a question mark? And then the final slide here, so then all my slides are done, is there was concern um, through multiple answers or comments to the questions around level of service, macro versus micro level of service. Uh, and I'm hoping that when we regroup after seeing Neil this afternoon, Neil Holden this afternoon, that we can sort of go through water care and you'll get a sort of an idea of what you may expect in terms of level of service from a larger entity um, if the entity was to turn out water care-esque in its operations. Okay. Um, we'll crack on with um, Carl, I think, if that's okay. Yeah, no problems, guys. We don't have heaps to go. Um, so where we left off before the break was we were talking about level of service. And, you know, uh, there was a, a concern that came through in the comments from the survey that um, that particularly the micro level of service, you know, what's going to happen to the little old lady with her water leak um, was something we wanted to explore. So in saying that, 
I thought I'd pair that concern with um, a bit of a comparison of water care because we've, we've used it, I've used it, and chucked it out there to sort of say, hey, um, we already have a large-scale entity in New Zealand, let's have a look at them and what they do, not saying that, we, that the entity would become like that, not saying that uh, this is how Entity B, this is only available to entity, entity B, but as a representation of something a bit larger than uh, council scale, what are they capable of delivering? So um, I wouldn't take these away as hard lessons or definitive facts of exactly how the entities would work, um, no matter what their scale is, but at least it's a useful comparison in New Zealand setting to say, well, okay, well, that is achievable in New Zealand uh, in that way. So the first one here is actually nothing about that at all. It was the, the question that came up about affordability. Uh, in this case, why has water care's costs increased? I know we've, uh, we sent out some emails about this and some comments that were on the water care website. But the difference here is or what's happening is uh, water care is increasing their water charges by seven and a half to nine and a half percent. The reason for that is they've developed a new asset management plan, which has identified $9 billion worth of investment over 10 years. Uh, because they are a CCO of Auckland City Council, their, um, their debt sits on the Auckland City Council balance sheet. The Auckland City Council balance sheet has suffered a revenue drop due to COVID-19, which means that more of the funding for this $9 billion in the next 10 years needs to come directly from revenue as opposed to borrowing because Auckland City Council is at their debt limit. The reason I, reason I raise that is one, that was raised in the previous workshop, but two, to highlight that at least in the government's current proposal, that that wouldn't happen to the entities because of the balance sheet separation. So I think a lot of, I think everybody probably gets that point, but I just wanted to highlight it for certainty. Um, so I had some other notes here that I was going to read from. Yeah, so essentially, COVID-19 revenue drop for Auckland City Council is the driver there. They're not doing anything different, fundamentally different to what we would do as a normal planning entity around the water service, and we'll probably expect no difference. There's nothing weird happening at water care which is driving these costs. It's just um, debt to revenue and the structure of the balance sheet. So with that said, um, delivery. So the question came up about Delivery. How would water care? How does water care deliver infrastructure? Is it fundamentally better than ours? Uh, and I guess the conclusion I sort of came to, or the conclusion I did come to, was uh, that there's two elements to it. One, they've got more capacity to deliver than we do. They've got a lot more project managers and a lot more support structure around their project managers, which help them deliver um, their infrastructure. They've um, obviously got $9 billion to, to deliver in the next 10 years, uh, and they wouldn't be that multiple, that multiple larger than us. So if you compare our balance sheet and our capital delivery, sorry, Suze, I forgot what it is off the top of my head. Oh, $11 million. If you had to multiply that up, um, what's that, a 1,000 times to get $11 billion, I don't think you'd have to multiply our work our workforce by 11,000 to get to a water care scale, if you understand what I'm getting at. They're a lot more efficient with the human resource they have. Uh, the second thing I sort of noted was uh, their maturity around project delivery. So they have a very defined project management uh, framework. They issue um, industry briefings around the, the Capital Works program, things that we are aspiring to do and we're moving the direction of. They're just there now. So they do deliver things a bit better than us, uh, basically because they're a bit more efficient about how they use their human resource, which is due to their scale. And two, they've got a more mature project delivery framework and project management framework. And um, yeah, and that's that's what the drivers are there. I did though have some chats with, um, offline chats with a few people who worked for Watercam and they, they indicated that because they're so large, they have a bit of a fundamentally different way of running some of their infrastructure here at MPDC, we tend not to run to fail. We try to replace um, on age or condition before failure. But because of the size of the asset base at Watercare, sometimes they run to fail. They're happy to say, that piece of kit, we'll just run it. We won't replace it until it's actually dead. But again, they're much larger. Um, that's less significant across the whole asset base. And because they're larger, they also tend to have access to 
replacements on hand, whereas we usually have to buy us off the shelf from a supplier. Okay. Hey, Carl, I'll just go to Neil. He's got his hand up. Yeah, a question. So that's that's good, Carl. That's that's in their future, of course. But what have what have they delivered like, you know, as a percentage of their capital works? You know, what's I couldn't find anything like on, you know, are they completing 90 or 100 percent or are they completing 65 to 70 percent on time and how far out and stuff you know like i mean it's great that they say they're going to do nine billion in the future because it's like us but where are they going to get the people from but what have they done historically yeah what have they so that's, um so i'm still trying to hunt down something that's um applicable to us in that space my my usual contact at watercare has moved on so he's hooked me up with a couple of others one of which i do know so i'm getting to the bottom of that what I've been able to find so far, which is not too satisfying, is in the last financial year, they've it's been a record level of delivery. They've never spent more money than they did in the last financial year, and that's including COVID. So there's no COVID adjustment of where they would have spent. That is actual dollars spent. They've never spent more. Is what they had out yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, the driver is the drought. They've had a lot more to do, but they're actually getting it done is what their top line message is. But I haven't quite been able to dive under that yet, Neil, and just sort of pick that apart and see where they're not delivering or where they are delivering. That's 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 to me is the key because I mean we could say, we could write a, a LTP now saying we're going to do that three hundred million, but if we don't do it, it doesn't really matter. Like it's the same. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Carry on, um, Carl. Thanks. Cool. Um, the other question there was the actual direct level of service. Um, you know, how do water care manage on their level of service? So you all, would have all seen those statements of intent or level of service diagrams or or representations that I'd sent around or Don sent around on my behalf earlier in the week. Uh, and you can see they're, they're at least, they're much more detailed in the level of service or how they define level of service and measure it. There's seven key accountability areas, some of which we don't even measure or have in our portfolio at the moment, such as sustainability. Uh, and you sort of see, importantly, uh, customer satisfaction targets they have there, which is where their response times are. They're meeting all those targets, and the targets aren't too dissimilar. They're not the same, but they aren't too dissimilar to what we have here in, in district. For example, urgent call-outs attended within 60 minutes with a resolution within five. That sounds like a, a level of service that we wouldn't be too unhappy with here in the district, if, uh, and non-urgent call-outs attended within three days, resolved within six. You know, so we all know, um, unfortunately, Lance isn't here to sort of talk to that, but those sorts of levels of service aren't too alien to us, aren't too unresponsive to us, considering what we deliver today. I'm not saying that's where we want to be, uh, but they're not too, not too dissimilar, and they're making them. Um, another element of water care relative to us, for example, or a larger entity relative to us, is this concept of centre of excellence and staff retention. So um, water care or an entity may be large enough to generate uh, what they what we call a centre of excellence. And Mott McDonald did some research on this uh, for LGNZ in the not too distant past uh, when they were talking about Wellington Water. And what they found was that um, evidence to date across um, a bunch of water players internationally is that when all organizations are given the ability to specialize in the provision of one service, in this case, water, uh, from a previously council-owned, diverse portfolio of, um, of services environment, there's definitely an, a benefit to attracting and maintaining good quality staff. Uh, and that they've been able to grow the, those staff members and um, develop their skill set whilst also improving well, they're called a client, but customer understanding of the business and how the business runs, improving um, customer satisfaction and um, what's the word I'm looking for? Confidence, customer confidence in the business um, through the implemented implementation of what they call a center of excellence approach. Uh, they did, though, admit that a while a center of excellence does provide career development opportunities, job opportunities and the like, uh, it does come with, uh, at least in the short term, an increase in costs as you invest into those workforces. So water care relative to us is able to deliver, because they're larger and possibly a larger entity, will be able to deliver the centre of excellence. I don't think we have to be too much larger to start 
thinking in this way. I just know from my time at Waikato when we were doing the CCO work, this was a key pillar was, um, was the CCO large enough to deliver a centre of excellence? And we definitely thought at the time, Waikato, Waipa and Hamilton together would be large enough to deliver a centre of excellence approach. So the point there being, if you can do that, you sort out some of your staff retention and career path um, problems. Uh, and then this last side on Waterkey here was procurement and market power. So on the left-hand side there, we have the, um, the TBM, Tunnel Boring Machine. And the point I wanted to make with that image was that um, water care is of a scale, being a large entity is of a scale where they can get their hands on this type of technology. You would never see MPDC, and I say have confidence, implementing a piece of kit like this. This, this machine has come over from Germany. Uh, it's a tunnel, tunnel boring machine, as I said. It can travel underground between 15 and 110 metres and as it drills a pipe or a, a um, tunnel. It is going to drill a tunnel for Auckland, the Auckland Interceptor, Central Interceptor Project. It's 14.7 kilometres long and it's tall enough and wide enough, that's the tunnel, to fit a giraffe or four rhinos side by side. It's massive. It's a four and a half metre diameter pipe uh, tunnel. So they had the ability to reach out internationally and get this sort of technology here in New Zealand, delivering infrastructure for us. Um, a large scale entity would probably have that sort of power as well to play in those international markets for this bit of kit. I reckon Don could afford to run that. Maybe, possibly. What? Well, I'm not sure about that, Ash. <laughs> the, the, take, the take our message is it's, it's really impressive and it's a type of technology that I think we'd probably all agree we'd love to have access to. We might not use it in our district, but if we had to use it in our district, you'd love to be able to phone someone up and get it. And a larger entity has that power to reach out and do that better than we can. Run it through the Koimois, make another Koimoi tunnel. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, maybe not. Maybe not a water problem that one, but yes, <laughs> we could provide as a service to roading. Um, the other element there, the the right hand image there, is about the enterprise model. So, um, water care is of a size that they're able to implement what they call an enterprise model for um, procuring of their construction and um, consultancy services, and it's a cutting edge methodology here in New Zealand. So much so that that snippet is an article. On the, the um, Auditor General's website, they actually asked Watercare, the Auditor General asked Watercare to come in and have a bit of a chat to them about how procurement works for a large, large scale um, entity using the enterprise model. So it's so, at least in my mind, it's so cutting edge uh, and so progressive in this procurement space that even the Auditor General needed to be schooled up on it by Watercare. So um, some metrics about that particular approach. Uh, under that model, they've signed a $2.4 billion construction partnership with Fulton Hogan and Fletcher Construction. You might say, big whoop, you know, it's fine. You're going to get Fletcher's and Fulton to deliver some stuff, but it's the added stuff on top of that what this model is able to leverage. For example, that $2.4 billion will also drive a 40% reduction in the carbon footprint of the infrastructure that they're implementing. Uh, reduce, they were going to reduce the cost of the delivery the infrastructure by 20% relative to performance of today, and they'll improve health and safety and well-being aspects of their people delivering that infrastructure by 20% as well. They call it the 40-20-20 challenge, and it's that extra level because of their size and their ability to leverage the market. It's the extra level of service and performance over and above just build up hype that they, that they can get out of the market that potentially we can't. Or maybe not as rapidly. So that's what you might see in terms of um, performance out of a larger entity. Again, I think this might be relatively independent to the size of the entity. You, you wouldn't have to have an entity B to do this. So, so I might just pause there if anyone's got any questions about that sort of stuff. Again, it's meant to be a flavour, not a not a definitive. Any uh, questions for Carl? Pretty explain. Yep, all good. All good, Carl. Carry on. Cool. So that leaves us the last three slides for today from me. And, oops, go down. There we go. 
and that was um i was trying to i was trying to think where we might land at the end of today so i put some slides together about where we could take the discussion forward from here as as council as our staff supporting council with their preparation of um some feedback to government and this is where i thought we might have might have landed by the end of today i don't think it's right but i think it's relatively close to what i was hearing out of the discussions around the um the survey results that you know overall it seems that we think that there's an increasing regulation and quality standards that will drive costs aggregation um of the services into asset owning entities the asset owning ones become a question now because um bruce himself sort of talked about he's okay at least from his point of view okay with some form of um, shared service but didn't go quite as far as asset owning but a aggregation model may provide an appropriate mechanism to mitigate some of the affordability cha challenges for communities in the future. However, um, the proposed entities that the government suggested are too large and that negatively affects connectivity with the customer base, dilutes influence unreasonably and raises the prospect of future privatization. So those were sort of not, to, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I thought this is a seed particle that you can either reject or you can work on or you can mull over and sort of say, reflect on, say, well, based on the results of the um, survey, is this the type of statement we want people to sort of pick up from the words we're using or the statements we're making? John, um, John wants to say something. He's probably want to stop yeah. me. Yeah, Don. <laughs> no, not at all, Carl. That was really, well, well, I hope Council finds that really useful. I just wrote down some words, uh, Mr. Chairman, as we're going through today's discussion. Yep. Um, I wrote uh, down two words. Yeah, well, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, aggregation, size, stormwater, director appointment, asset ownership, slow down. Now, I mean, I was just writing things down as they came up, and uh, Carl's actually Carl's statements encapsulate some of the, some of that uh, mm. those words, but. Ms. Chairman, in the sense, I, I was interested in Neil um, Holden's 12 questions, and I thought that, by the sound of it, we're using quite a few of those words mm. and provided not a bad framework, possibly, to consolidate council's thinking. So um, that could be uh, another added tool we use, but... Is it possible uh, for council today to, without uh, making a position at all on whether or not um, you support the reforms or not support the reforms, is there some acknowledgement in words or statements that would sum up the collective view of council, or is it too early to to settle on anything? Uh, Sue. Don, I was just wondering if you could do the same with those questions as you did with this week's. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, put them in. Put them in. Uh, a little bit of chance. chance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A little bit of chance to think about it and come yeah. up with. Yeah. Yeah, I, I like that idea too, Sue. Donna, and then Bruce. Um, I just think it's too soon to make a decision. You know, at this stage, I might like to mull over it a bit. Um, I'm really sitting on the fence with, with this one. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a big call, and I don't think we should be, you know, it's, yeah, I think we should be sending that letter that Ash is going to write to, to, um, to the government, like we proposed before lunch. But if we could just mull, up, mull over the rest of it and get back into the boardroom, it'd be much, be much better. Yeah. yeah. Um, thanks, Donna. Totally agree. Bruce? Um, I, I found uh, Neil's, um, I'll call it a presentation, um, refreshing. Um, I, th I think we need to have a look at what he sent to you, those 12 comments and, and all that sort of stuff, because I think that could be the basis of um, putting together something as a council. Um, we're, we're definitely not, in my mind, on uh, in an ability to, to say much more at the moment. Um, 
but um, the, the information we've got today, and then I say, and Neil's um, Holden's um, sort of review of how they're looking at it is one where he says um, we're, we're, our hands are going to be forced ultimately from from um, from government. Um, so how do we how do we get um, the best out of it? Um, you know, I can't see them not mandating it if 33 or 45 or 60 councils um, say no. That I still think they'll mandate it. It, it is a political agenda that's got nothing more than that in my mind. Okay. Yep. James Thomas. Just, just really reiterating what um, Donna said. I think, you know, this is something I'd really like to be sitting in the boardroom with, you know, with with all the information that we're gathering and and just quietly go through it face to face. I mean, Zoom, it's all very well. It's keeping us in the loop, but it's it, this is a huge decision. Bruce mm -hmm. might be quite right. They might they may mandate it and take it all away from us, but that's that's nothing we've got any control over. What we've got control over is trying to put together the best response that we can for our community. Um, and, and this is an enormous decision that we will have to make around around the table and uh, you know how much um, you know how much community involvement can we do before that? Um, you know, there's so many things there sitting there that I'm uncomfortable with 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 being in haste with this, and I just think we can't, you know, afford to to you know make a, a quick decision here. We've got a we've got a lot of stuff that we've got to sift through, and um, and doing it on Zooms just not satisfactory. I mean, it's just you know it is what it is at the moment, um, but hopefully. We're back in, a, back in a stage here. And like I say, if the government mandates it, well, there's FA we can do about that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, totally, totally get it. Adrian. Adrian, can, can, you're muted. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, it does go back to probably what I said last week at a... Um, about that assurance for our communities as to what what we want, you know, and how we can influence. And this has been really good. And last week was really good as well because it's painting, it's starting to put those puzzle pieces together that our, our gut feeling is that we're not comfortable and that information is definitely coming through that's reinforcing our gut feel, you know, because it's our head and our heart at the end of the day that's that we're putting into this. And yeah, I um, I guess we can't. Well, hopefully we can get into the boardroom soon, but I don't think we can hedge our bets on that too much because we don't know what's in front of us in that respect either. I think it'd be a pretty courageous government to mandate it yeah. if the bulk of the councils pushed back. And then go. I go back to the boardroom a few uh, quite a few weeks ago where I think James's words were to me about destabilising this project. And this is literally what is starting to happen because if a lot of the councils push back, yeah. then who who's actually right? Because this is what it comes down to is who's actually right? And maybe our entity, I was just thinking about it with what Neil said about them being happy that they weren't with Wellington and, and Palmerston North and Napier, Hamilton, and now with Hamilton pushing back the way they are, our entity probably when you talk about cross subsidization it would be that's what again i said last week it'd be really interesting to understand where cost, the cross subsidization sits within our entity b having a lot of private water supply so this is going to be really um really really interesting and and uh, yeah we're forming some really getting some really good information this has been excellent absolutely excellent yep yeah no it has been great um, just, I like Neil Holden, Ash. Yeah, he's he's not a bad character. Um, we have some good discussions, as you can All imagine. Those blokes called Neil know what they're doing. <laughs> yeah. mm. it must, 
It must be the name, eh? It's in there. It's in there. Hey, Ash. Yep. Um, what about our um, consul? What What do the iwi think? And, and um, um, have we the, started that consultation process? The yeah, the the iwi that I have talked to in different hui's meetings, you know, like um, not related, but the topic has come up. Um, the feeling I've I've been given from them is they're not keen. They're not keen. Yeah, because so, it was interesting to know. That, that was yeah. one of the key key and, um, components of, and of that uh, also, how they feel. Yeah, that also came up in um, Wellington as well, that um, they weren't happy about it what whatsoever. So, yeah. So is, is um, Tuatahi taking any processes with this at yeah. the moment? Yeah, yeah. Uh, he, I can, he, so he I can on. provide an update on that. Sorry, team, I can provide an update on that. So Tuatahi along with... Um, liaison from TCDC and Hauraki have organised a hui on the 13th of September. So DIA will be involved in that. So that's just hot off the press today. Mm. Sorry to interrupt, Mirish. No, 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 that's fine. That, uh, I was actually just going to say that. So that's, <laughs> you saved me a job. No, that's really good. And um, if you think about it, it I, I, I know I could have this totally wrong, so don't quote me on it, but I, I think that the iwi concerns are pretty much the same as ours, you know, because uh, they don't see themselves, and it's even more complex for them, because when you're talking about the amount of iwis over the Entity B proposal, you're talking hundreds mm. of different iwis. Now, we all know that, and, and, you know, that not, not, they don't often get along all that well, so... You know, this is hugely complex. And again, how do you pick six people to represent? You, it, and this is, this is the whole thing. I, I don't think, and I said this from day one, Don will know this, like, I don't think they realised how complex this is. They've come up with an idea that they think this will be good. They're just, you know, I still believe they just wanted one entity, to be fair. And... Um, you know, this is this is huge, guys. Like you say, and 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 um, yeah, and and I, I'm very much starting to see the cracks appear. And you can, and this is where, and I've only got this information the last couple of days. And then, you know, talking to different people and just being a part of the uh, mural forum meetings, and then starting to hear, oh, hello, and then. You know the thing with Al Gen Z now and Stuart Crosby, and it's it's starting to get real, and people are actually starting to think about it a little bit more. And it, put it this way, I believe the tide's starting to turn towards the negative instead of the positive, very much so, in an escalating scale. To be fair, but we'll see. Um, I don't think. I'd like to think they wouldn't make it mandatory as well, because I think, like you said, that would be a hell of a bold move, and that would be pretty shaky grounds for a government to do that. But I wouldn't underestimate this one. So um, yeah, but I think we're, I'm comfortable with the way we're going with our um, workshops, and our, I think they're constructive. I think it's been very good, but. Um, and appreciate the staff as well, you know, putting the time in and, and under these Zoom conditions, it's not ideal. It's hard. It's even, it's hard to run a meeting when you're trying to look for hands and things like that, and you're losing momentum and vibe. So um, I agree totally with you saying that it'll be good when we get back in the room. But I think we are starting to form a, a bit of a picture of where we want to go. And I'll shut up now and go to Don. Uh, yeah, Mr. Chairman, sorry. So I think uh, the impression I got from Neil Holdham, and, and uh, I don't, it would be interesting to see if everybody else picked up it up in the same way I did, was similar to where I thought we might have got to last week and part of today, and that is taking a position of no regrets. Um, because I think he, he said it, it as part of his discussion that now's the time for maximum leverage. So yeah. rather than, and I'm not saying you're not allowed to say we reject this, but um, if this comes about through whatever means, 
what are the matters that you feel need to be made or what are the views or the issues or concerns that you need to make, that they want to make? Uh, because you won't have another chance. No, and I think I think, but I don't think that needs to be done today. I think no, 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 no. Yeah. No, I was yeah. just trying to. Yeah. No, no, not at all. Uh, and I'm and this this whole eight week period is not about coming to necessarily to a position. Well, it's not meant to be to take a position. It's meant to be understand, explore, consider, suggest. Uh, criticize um, because the sense I was getting and there are elements of of these changes which you're not uh, how can I put it that you don't reject out of hand There's, you know there are a- aspects of it looking at our future looking at our challenge my sense of what I understood council was espousing sort of collectively was there was a case of some aggregation. Now, you, you don't like Entity B, but uh, have you accepted that the, in principle those aspects, but what you want to influence is the size on the director appointment, that type of thing. Yeah. But we've only, we've only had to be come to that position or we've only had to um, come to a position around um, we think that there may be some aspects of a, some kind of uh, aggregation that could potentially benefit us because of this reform proposal. If we wouldn't even, this wouldn't be in a conversation uh, two years ago or even 18 months ago, wouldn't have been in a, a um, conversation. No, no, absolutely, and I'm not suggesting otherwise. I mean, 18 months ago, I think we we're all accepting that um, that with a regular a regulator coming on board and, and oops, me, with a regulator coming on board, uh, we were going to have to respond in some manner at some point. This has sped that process up, I suppose, and they've put a proposition in the, on the table that they feel sits alongside. That regulatory environment, or that, or regulatory uh, demands that will be placed on the system. Break, breaking up there. Uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. So, so my point, my point being that my sense of it is that council had is, is in a space where it's saying, "Hey, uh, we need to take a position of not a position. We need to identify issues on a no regrets basis because if we don't make our points now." and simply say no, then, well, that doesn't have any influence, I suppose, is what I'm saying. Yep. Adrian. So thinking about that, you know, like with us, obviously that there's a, an appetite for aggregation and we're sort of saying, well, you know, regional council size or Thames Valley, if you Look at it from the government's perspective. If they have that, um, you know, it's about influence. So if they have that come to it, how's it going to work? Because, again, those models, it, it basically gets thrown out the window, doesn't it? Because <clears throat> are we, you know, with us suggesting like a, a smaller model, are we suggesting that regional council <clears throat> run it? You know, like this This is, I guess this is the other thing to flesh out what, what degree of influence we want to have and what that means because we can say yeah we want this but it doesn't just happen because now that that means there's another set of work to occur to create the the model yeah and this and this has been my concern adrian because right from day one going back over a year here there's been no other option or proposed option it's just been this in its entirety yeah um James Sainsbury, I think, had your hand up. No? Don? No, no, sorry, I must have, should have brought it down, sorry. I'll put mine up. So I suppose, while I do have you here, um, is there any messaging 
out of today of any particular flavor or theme that you feel would be appropriate that reflects not that you've come to any particular position today other than we're going to go through a series of questions that have been structured by representative mayors and others uh, on behalf of Entity B that potentially will assist in clarifying our thinking about what, what it is we do and don't like. Uh, is there any, any theme coming out of today other than a continuation of the what, what was effectively released from last week? Like we've still we've still got a few a few weeks, haven't we? Before yeah, we, absolutely, absolutely. In, 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 end of September is it? We have to have our response. Yep, to yep, 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 yeah. yeah. And remember, it's not a decision to opt in or opt out. No, no. It, it's a commentary on what you like, don't like, what you believe is an improved position potentially. Mm. But the sense I was getting from Neil was where he was heading. Was that he was trying? He was trying to say, "Well, what?" I'm paraphrasing. He he sort of said to me, "He thinks it's going to happen, right?" So, what are the things I would really like to try and influence in terms of that position? And by the way, if they don't happen, um, we're going to be looking to work with some of our neighbours because we think we can make something work that will meet the new environment uh, as well. Mm. Mm. And abide by the regulations, you know, with what the regulator is proposing. You know, it's well, all that, all that factor of of us business as usual in some respects, and you know, and working in a in a um, more stringent environment. Because I th I think at the end of the day, the you know, and they talk about Havelock North and that, but that was because there was a you know the regional councils weren't perhaps upholding the. The, the regional policy statements either. So no, this is and, the part and, of why the regulators exactly. come in. That was a failure of regulation, Adrian. They yeah. did not, they complied with the New Zealand drinking water standards. Oh, that's right. They did too, yeah. They complied. Uh, they didn't chlorinate and they mm -hmm. didn't know their ag with aquifer, so which heightened your risk, but yeah, that yeah. was provided for in the regulation. But I had to say this, and I think I've made the point previously, there's nothing like the prospect of the sword hanging over your neck to make you focus the mind to address mm. quality control, uh, systems, process, skills development, all of those things. They are an incentive in the absence of market pressure. Mm. I think I think one of the challenges though going forward is going to be this the iwi um, and their expectation that that our water our treated water will not be discharged into waterways. This Correct. is the, this is the the elephant in the room. Is it's not about ownership as much as people think it's about ownership, and that's why I think it's a critical point here is that is this these entities are about pipes and infrastructure it, you know i really took that really resonated with me don what you said this morning is it's not about the water this is pipes and infrastructure but it's so yeah and that's where the ownership issue that's out in the public gets a bit but skewed but it's the wastewater the cost of of treating that water and not being able to discharge it into a waterway when it's probably cleaner than the water that's in there, to use Cambridge's example of what they're talking to spending on the, to put theirs into the Waikato River. Yeah, and that 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 pressure won't ease off, uh, yeah. irrespective of whether these entities proceed or not proceed. To be quite candid, Adrian. Yeah, yeah, that's um, that's that's the thing. That that's that's the road we're we're travelling down, regardless of what what package it looks like. Correct. Mm. Ash? Um, John, sorry, I got my hand up, Ash, you, you, you're busy. Um, John, regarding the message to go out. Yep, yep. Um, Andrea uh, is in there somewhere. Yes, Can we is. say exactly what happened today, that we, we had further discussion and we met with Neil Holden and blah, 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 um, yep. 
to take another you know perspective on it yeah. i'm just i'm just getting really concerned about the sh shit that's hitting this sort of conversation i just find it completely a waste of time um, and it's only whipping people up in a different way. So can we just say exactly what what happened today? That we yeah we can we can keep it. Know, our, our thinking is is being expanded. Um, you know that's sort of fine. Is that okay, Andrea? Are you there? Yeah, I'm there. I'm here. Um, absolutely. Yeah. So last time, uh, as I did last week. Sorry, I'll do a draft. And yeah. if I haven't nailed any of that, then please, you know, that is there for you to make comment. It's not just something you need to accept. That happy to have input um, to drill into something more, um, change the words, um, or get rid of things. So, you know, when that comes out, please um, have some input if you feel that's warranted. Yeah. That, that's really good, and, and Andrea. Um, also, you know, just thinking about you know, with these responses and our feedback to government, da, 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 um, I'd hate to think that we, we, we must have sort of, um, convey what sort of position our position is yet like on um, some of these this feedback to government I'd hate for them to um, some, I don't know how to phrase this but we haven't got an opinion yet of, we, of, of our decision in December so I'd hate to think our feedback in coming coming up at the end of the month might give them an impression of what what where we go where we're heading well, I think, I think um, Donna, an approach to that is what we spoke about last week, is we don't agree with the reforms. Yeah. However. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Are you comfortable if I say that? No. No, okay, that's good. It's a bit, bit too soon. I think my impression is it's a bit too soon at the moment. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and the public want to have their say. That's been quite obvious in some other feedback already they, I, they want to I'm comfortable with that being said yeah I'm not can I ask, can I ask a question um, on the financial side I, I think Lamy has mentioned this at some stage but I can't for life me remember what she said um, if we are going to lose the income from rating three waters and we're also going to lose the liabilities, the liabilities of, of whatever debts on there. What 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 did that? What effect did that have on our on our bottom line again? The oh, effect uh, the effect is that your debt headroom will go up. You will be able to carry more debt, and the reason for that is that that our debt, uh, whilst our revenue was screwed towards our three waters as you know as part of the whole it's a, a large proportion but so are the liabilities so you take away the liabilities and you're left with a revenue stream that doesn't current isn't currently maxed out on other things so you in short you'll be able to do more other capital things okay so does that mean the three waters income wasn't propping up the other it was the other propping, off, propping up three waters. Is that what you're saying? No, no, no. Um, uh, I think three waters, because of the staggered uh, re renewal profile, was providing money to the other activities. I think there was a cash surplus in that regard. But that's a moment in time. I think over the over the period, if you saw, saw Lania's um, graphs, our current debt headroom, including three waters, is projected to go down to about as small as 13 million, right? So one of the concerns we expressed this morning, one of the issues, sorry, one of the issues you had to reflect on was that $13 million worth of headroom or three waters included was a narrow gap to bridge. If something went out of, you know, if suddenly suddenly two or three projects cost $5 million more than, than what we had anticipated, then our headroom will run out, will be maxed out, and they may, because we'll become dominated by three water renewals. Yeah, what we're saying, sorry. Uh, the only thing I'd say to that, though, Don, is that um, with the three waters, yeah, we might have a bit of a uh, 
debt or spend, but we cover that with the targeted rate that covers that. If we take that out of there, and yes, we've got headroom to borrow for um, CAPEX or uh, projects, but they might not necessarily have an income attached to those. And that would end up coming on to the general rate, potentially. Well, it would do. Uh, yep, yep, you're right. But the debt still shows on our books because ultimately we underwrite those projects hmm. or those activities. And in yep. the same way that Auckland City, for example, last year when COVID hit, <coughs> relied on 60% of their income uh, for their whole uh, income uh, base was relied on user charges. Uh, that collapsed overnight and they had a $500 million hole. So they had to underwrite that hole. So I'm not... Uh, we're, we're trying to stress this morning, we're not trying to scaremonger or... But I'll come back to the statement I made last week and repeat it again this morning, is that if we go, if we if these reforms go ahead and we decide to opt out, we'll become a very different council in some ways to those who choose to opt in. Just because we won't have direct responsibility for the managing of water wastewater assets and funding of them directly. Now, that's not saying it's right or wrong. That's just saying, and you may decide, well, for a whole lot of reasons, that's fine. Um, what I'm saying is you need to be conscious of that decision. If, if we were to, I don't think we'll be the only ones. No, and that's fine. That's, that's cool. So everyone makes their own decision. And we get on with life and deal with the issues as they come up. Okay. Uh, Kevin, have you finished or is uh, over to Bruce? I'm fine. Okay. Bruce. Um, yeah, just, just a, a bit more clarification. I know one of the slides last week when we were talking financials showed um, some accumulated cash reserves. Uh, was it eight million dollars? Eight something? and a half million. Yeah, eight and a half million. Yep. Right, and you and you weren't sure what would happen with that. Well, no. that that um, document that that support package information says councils will be encouraged to use accumulated cash reserves that have been earmarked for future water infrastructure prior to go live. Right, it is intended that any material reserve balances remaining at go live will be transferred to the new entity. So you can take it that that eight million dollars goes yep. away with it too. All right, that's mm. correct. So what's mm. the what's the material effect of that, Bruce? The material effect of that is that our external debt goes up by eight point five million because the eight point five million that we've currently accumulated from water revenue at which we haven't yet spent or committed is, is linked to the other activities, linked to the other activities as internal borrowing. And so, that's what you were discussing. Uh, you were talking yeah. about the split between an internal and external yeah, borrowing. So, so, you know, so, so I just wanted to make that clear. So yep. the financial effect of that is the greater interest rate we'll pay by going to the bank than what we actually charge ourselves. And that's about 1%, something like that. So, so in effect, would that mean our $17.2 million carrot would be a um, 10 and a half million or whatever it is? Um, I suppose in terms of cash reserves, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just yeah. Tra transferring. Yeah. So, yeah. so the, the net effect is about a one. What's one percent of eight million? Bugger all. <laughs> and that's the increased cost. Yeah. By having to give Unless that. Unless we spend it. Yeah. Yeah, that's what they're saying. It. Yeah, exactly, Neil. And that's what they're saying in that book. Get on and spend the bloody stuff. Yeah. Except, except on that, uh, we, you'd have to spend it by the first of July, twenty twenty four, and uh, you yeah, know you, yeah. you may not, and it's got to be spent on if it's been earmarked for water infrastructure, then it has to be spent on water infrastructure. Right. Um, 
So, you know, we, we talk about the ability to spend now. So, you know. Yeah, but that, we, that, we, 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 even spending it now, though, Bruce, we still have to yeah. spend it on water and wastewater. We've got no yeah, choice. Yeah. That's yeah. right. Yeah. It's tagged. It's tagged for that purpose. It's tagged. It's tagged for that. Yeah. yeah. Okay, any more questions or are we pretty much? Um, <laughs> I like that comment. I just saw. Um, yeah, can, uh, <laughs> no. Can wrap, this, wrap this up and um, head to q and I think, are we? Yeah, two more slides, guys. So, oh, um, shit. sorry, <laughs> Carl, mate. Sorry. All right. That's all right. They're not. You guys are largely, I think, I think I guesstimated you guys are largely going to be in this space anyway. So um, this slide here was about remember to focus that eventually at the end of this, we have to give some sort of feedback to the government on their proposal. And these are some of the points that I think I was picking up from the, um, from the question answers, from the survey answers, um, you know, do with them what you will. You know, one, the mechanism to ensure ultimate accountability to the customer, where is that? Um, some sort of definition around how the various agencies will direct the entity, how the government intends to ensure that there's meaningful engagement in the reform going forward, in particular around protection of the privatisation or helping government slash local, um, territorial authorities undertake community consultation. Um, this one here has come up a lot, but I've maybe made this quite a bit wordier than it needed to be, but essentially some further proofing of assumptions and economic model to show that the benefits they reckon they're going to deliver are actually going to be there. Uh, one of those points, and that's why it's in italics that came up today, was as a council, you don't seem to believe that there is capacity in New Zealand Inc. to deliver on their model, and therefore that invalidates the model. So possibly you'd want to bring that back up and say, well, yep. can you take that into account and, and figure out how realistic it is to deliver the benefits that you're proposing? Uh, the other one there that's come up today was how unreasonable the timeline has been and possibly needs to be reconsidered. On. These yeah. are just thoughts that I gathered. You don't need to use them, but I thought hopefully try to crystallise thinking. No good. No good. Especially um, the last two. Thanks. Um, the last one here for today is if you wanted, to, in my mind, if you wanted to pro uh, propose an alternative model, then this might be the maybe the steps you go through to get something together by the end of the period, uh, mm. which would be obviously decide what boundary you're going for. And the mayor and council, you guys would sort of figure that out. You mm. probably need to do some determining of support for the alternative boundary. So you need to talk to your mates. Uh, yeah. And that would be um, Don and Ash would probably need to do a bit of that. And then there'll probably be some sort of stacking up of an alternative boundary uh, versus the outcomes needed from the reforms. You know, how much is it more affordable? Uh, how much access does it have to financing? Um, how could it better engage in our context? How could it better engage with the customer base? Uh, is capacity to deliver, et cetera, et cetera. So this is sort of things I thought, if you wanted to pursue it, we have to fit in in the next four weeks. Yeah. For, for the fifth week for you guys to sign off something saying this is our letter and our content to government. So yeah. my question would be, is, is if we're looking at, forming a Thames Valley is where do we sit when we talk about cross subsidization because it doesn't matter wherever we sit within a group there will be a certain amount of cross subsidization and I just yeah it's again me just trying to see where we fit in the in the line of um of of where we're at and who which councils are still at risk because obviously Hamilton are obviously reasonably tidy, that they're sort of, I don't know, you know, they no, they, nobody comes out and says that they're in a mess like Auckland and Wellington are. So, but, you know, is, is, how, is Hauraki and is Terrams Coromandel, you know, are they, the you know, besides the fact that it's a Thames Valley catchment, is there a risk that Maramara Piako, if it was to go down that road, ends up cross-subsidising our neighbours? Well, I guess if we were in a even a regional one, those those players will still be in that tent anyway. Yeah, um, but will it be more dilute? You know, yeah. like it's, it's to understand how significant. There's um, probably, yeah, probably modelling they can do around that. Mm -hmm. Subsidising hydro. 
Uh, Bruce Stewhurst and James Sainsbury. Um, just, just my comment on cross subsidisation. That's really. Uh, I'm I'm not worried about cross subsidisation. I, I think that's a, a minor part to play in the overall concept of the whole thing. Okay. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, James, same three. Uh, yeah, so probably a couple of points. Um, one is more just a heads up, Ash, if, you, if at the end of this you could just summarise what all the next steps are that's going to happen because we've had, <laughs> sort of been talking for about 35 minutes, which has been great, but um, from when we first talked about it. If we could go back one slide, uh, Carl. So uh, I guess in terms of like the starting point of populating a feedback to the government proposal, that sounds fine. My understanding is that we'll be progressing this over the next couple of weeks and things will go on and things will come off. Is that fair? Yeah? Yep. Yep. Um, so then coming forward to the, the slide that Adrian was just talking about, uh, the next one down, is the alternative proposal. So, I mean, even if cross subsidization is just a small part of it, which I am not saying it is Adrian, but just um, taking on to Bruce's uh, point there, any other, why do we think that we are going to be able to do modeling or whatever else that is more robust than what um, plan, uh, plan to, like basically the thing that we're going to be part of in the future? I just, I, I just don't understand. Where's the, there's a fundamental, um, like when have we made this fundamental decision of we're going with it or we're not? Are we at the point where Neil is of, they'll hold them by them, a meaning where it's like, yeah, there's a better situation than the status quo. Um, the proposal could be a delivery model for that, but if it's not, then we were looking for something else. Like I just like that, that there looks like a huge amount of work. And I just, in the same way that we've ripped to pieces everything that's come to us, I just don't see how we are going to be able to manufacture anything that is anywhere near as robust as that. And then if we can just go back a couple of slides to the current position, did we agree that that's where the position's at or no? No, so I guess I guess just to be clear, Carl, that current position statement is, doesn't appear to have any support at the moment. Yeah, no, that's cool. It was yeah. meant to be seed particles for you guys to actually arrive at that conclusion. Like, no, that's not where we're at. So the, the, the onus is back on you guys, I guess, to rewrite this eventually over the next couple of weeks. And um, probably just the last part is um, in terms of what Andrea's manufacturing. Yep. Um, so whoever suggested, I think it might have been Donna, just about the, you know, we've expanded our knowledge and da 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 That all sounds great. Um, but I will take the opportunity to review and edit accordingly. So <laughs> good luck, Andrea, when all of that comes through. <laughs> um, I guess more just a heads up. So I don't quite know how that's going to be um, bouncing between the, the councillors because I, I will be taking a look and modifying it. Um, if I'm not totally comfortable with what it looks like. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Ash. Great. No worries, James. Cheers. Carl. To, to sort of address some of James' aspects there. So one, I, I popped a note into the chat there. I apologize about those who want to cross subsidization information. I will get on to it, just haven't got there yet. There was a, a couple of graphs published earlier in the whole thing, which sort of showed whose rates were where in each of the entities and we were sort of middle of the track so um, you can infer that if you're below the, the line you're going to get cross subsidized up to the line and those over the line we're going to go oh, other way around so if you're below the line you'll cross subsidize those above the line and vice versa but um we are sort of middle of the track but i'll find that and send it the second was addressing james's points there about this load of work i mean try i mean i'm not suggesting you do this it's again a thought Slide, what do you want to do? Uh, but the, the elements I put on there were sort of crafted from a, an idea or an understanding that I actually probably have a lot of this information already. For example, if you wanted to pursue a Waikato boundary, uh, that's pretty close to what they called Scenario 13. So Scenario 13 had all that sort of modeling from Wix about what the rates would be in 2051. 
So you'd sort of get an idea of affordability there. The financing aspect um, possibly comes down to, again, you could take those numbers. You've got those in the, the modeling stuff. You could do some assumptions, maybe not, something not super detailed, but some principles could be taken and some general views could be formed as what I'm postulating uh, about this. And whether you want to pick it up or not, or it's enough to say if you wanted to, oh, actually, we think there's an alternative model that needs to be investigated here. Full stop. It balls back in your court government. It's your reform. You do the work. I don't know. I think sometimes you need to make a bit of a suggestion as which way you're looking. Otherwise, you know, mm. which is the which is the most beneficial. Yeah. Rather than putting the full stop in, I think you need to make a suggestion yeah 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 i agree so so i guess it then goes back to us on the previous slide agreeing what the issues are with the current proposal i mean sorry going back a slide before then um you know if you agree with that first paragraph increasing regulation and quality standards will drive three water cost aggregation of service providers into asset only entities and an appropriate mechanism to mitigate manage affordability challenges for the communities like, I'm okay with that. I've got problems with the second one. Um, but if in the next slide, sorry, Carl, we're, we're, we're coming together with some areas that we've got concerns around, um, either there's not sufficient detail or we've got, but we don't think that what's been proposed is workable. Um, if we agree on those, and basically Carl's got a, a mix and match smorgasbord that we can choose from in terms of things that do actually comply with that better. Um, no, could be some alignment there. I agree with you, Sue, though. Um, you know, if we're, we want to be solutions orientated, right? Yeah. But again, I, I, I don't get the sense that we've actually agreed on that previous statement around um, increasing costs, opportunities for amalgamation to um, help offset that. So we're not even there yet. No. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, so I guess just following up, uh, Ash, if you could just sum up for us what the what's happening from here. So I'm looking forward to an email from Andrea <laughs> summarising what's happening today that's going out. Um, and then where are we sort of, what are we doing next week? Or how does it go from here, really? I've just lost track of that, sorry, with all of the discussion. Can I just say that I, I thought Neil's um, questions would, would focus us a little bit and um, may lead us into next week? If, you know. Yeah, well, that's, that, that was, I was actually going to suggest that we, I'll send out that information because, like I said, I was only able to open it at, at um, lunchtime. And yeah, I'll, I'll forward... survey, Ash, might, that might work. Pardon? I'll, if... I'll get Debbie to um, put it in. Yeah. Yeah. Well, of course. So, so, so two separate things, right, uh, from Neil. Ash, one is, uh, uh, do I understand correctly? One is the letter, um, which mm. we're going to get, you, which you've got, which we're all going to review and provide our feedback to you. Yep. Yeah. 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 Second to that is those 12 questions that he, he thinks about um, yeah. and that Debbie's going to put into a survey monkey of some description for us to tabulate sort of our thoughts around that and help focus a little bit more. Is that, do yeah. I get that right, Ash? Yep. Yep. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. Yep. No, that's one. And then um, basically, then we can, that should lead into a discussion points because I think it was um, useful how we got those questions the other day through from Don that we were able to answer in yep. um, part right. or in entirety. And then that was um, a good lead into um, the workshop today. So I think it can even get better. Um, the other thing I take from today is that. Um, It'll be great when we can get back in the boardroom because it's it's pretty tiring doing the old Zooms, <laughs> to be fair. Russell Smith, you got your hand up, and then I'll go to Adrian. And also that letter to be sent to the government on the, from the mayor. Yeah. 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 Which will probably just be, uh, you know, more broad line and in line with um, the letters that have been sent from other mayors in the uh, round, and I uh, believe the... South Island mayors have also done the same thing. Um, that, that, that article on, on stuff today from the Manawa two mayors very very well written too. There's some con, much the same concerns as we've got. Yep. Okay. Now that's cool. I haven't I've been able to um, have a look at that, but I'll have it check it out. 
Adrian. Yeah, I was just wondering about that ad, you know, whether we we whether there's an opportunity to add in your letter that you express um, concern at the, the ad that they put on TV and how it really does misrepresent, you know, like it's how, you know, like, because even um, Hamish said, you know, we're getting bagged for it and it's, and it's a little bit unfair. So whether there's something you could add in about that, I don't know whether it's a waste of time, but it just sort of bugs me. Are you allowed to say if we are offended? Uh, I, I, I actually stood up and told them that, uh, we were offended by it, and um, I said it was pop propaganda at its best. And I actually, I hit uh, Richard up from the DIA uh, face to face in Wellington, no, sorry, in Blenheim, and um, I said to him, "Where's this place in New Zealand that's got the slime coming out of the shower head?" And he just smirked and said, "It doesn't exist." And I said, "Where's the rivers where it's that toxic that your togs are dissolving and you can't swim in them?" that place doesn't exist either. And I said, so what's with the bullshit ads then? And he says, yeah, not my deal. I didn't create them. But, um, and I said, well, it's pretty disappointing and people aren't happy about it. And um, yeah. And then I was told that, oh, but the public like it. And I said, really? I haven't met anyone in the public that like it. In fact, yeah. anyone from the public that I've been in touch with uh, are offended by it as well. So we're two going forward. We're looking at the uh, drafting up a letter for the government, just with the concerns about what's going on. Then we've got the RMA, we've got the local government review and the three waters and dealing with the COVID locks, lockdowns and timeframes, suggesting that they just take a bit of a um, pause on it or a um, slow down on it. The workshop, We'll, uh, I'll flick that email straight out to all the councillors. I'll forward it on to you now so you can have a look at it. And then we get the feedback back to council to have a look at in regards to the next workshop, see if we can define it down a little bit more. Okay. Everyone happy with that? Yep. Cool. Adrian. Oh, the thumbs up. <laughs> I thought you had your hand up. Okay. Right. I think we'll wind it up. Thank you very much, Carl. That's been another um, uh, big one. And appreciate the time and effort that goes into it. From